to make sure you can hear me. Testing. Singapore is a state in which secret societies brutally killed rival gang members in three separate incidents in 2010. Singapore is a state in which 3,000 people are caught every year doing drugs. Singapore is a state in which Orchard Road was designated as a target on maps found with a dead GI operative in Indonesia. We say that detention without trial is both necessary and justified in addressing each of these three scenarios. Now, there are three acts of law which allow us to detain without trial. The Internal Security Act, the Criminal Law Temporary Provisions Act and the Misuse of Drugs Act. Now, these are used in different situations to achieve different ends. And these situations are clearly circumscribed by the law. Hence, detention is not used frivolously. Rather, it is used carefully when protecting society is of utmost concern. Opposition must be able to prove categorically that not one of these applications is justified. But first, both sides have to accept some harsh realities about Singapore. We are especially susceptible to terrorism. We are a small city-state with a history of religious sensitivities. And Jamia Islamia seeks to form an Islamic caliphate in Southeast Asia by completely obliterating us. Internally, violent criminal syndicates run a range of criminal activities, from drug trafficking to loan sharking to prostitution. In arguing that detention without trial is unjustified, team opposition needs to present us with viable alternatives to protect us from these very real threats. Now, issues of national security, moreover, are best dealt with by the executive and not the judiciary. The executive is democratically accountable to the people as opposed to the unelected judiciary. It holds access to important, sensitive information, allowing it to act expediently and with greater privacy. And the judiciary itself has publicly admitted that it's not suited to dealing with national security issues. As Lord Didlock said in the Council of Civil Service Unions versus the Minister for Civil Service, national security is the responsibility of the executive government. Because the reasons for the decision maker taking one course rather than another do not normally involve questions to which, if disputed, the judicial process is adapted to provide the right answer. And this is why detention without trial is justified. It ensures that national security is not compromised and gives us the best shot at rehabilitation. Judicial processes, on the other hand, are inept in achieving both. This can be seen on three levels, based on criminal law, the procedural demands of a, court, of a courtroom, and the outcomes of a trial. Firstly, let's examine the law and why it is unsuited to dealing with national security. There are individuals who pose a grave threat to society even before they have broken any laws. Why? Legislation tends to be retrospective. Law enforcement acts after the crime has been committed. But national security must be preemptive. We cannot wait for terrorist groups to finalize their plots, nor to attempt their attacks before we take action. And in Mohammed Abdul Hamid's case, for example, the clear intent to take up arms after listening to radical teachings posed another threat to warrant detention. And this is the purpose that detention without trial serves. It isolates the threat and prevents harm to society. It stops those who only seek to tear us apart. But at the same time, the system never stops checking itself to ensure that no one is wrongfully detained. Within the government, directors of the Internal Security Department or the Central Narcotics Bureau make the initial decision. The Minister of Home Affairs is personally responsible for approving these detention orders and has to defend his decision in Parliament. The President of Singapore has discretion in appointing an independent advisory board, including a Supreme Court judge. And then, based on their advice, the President is then free to overrule the Minister. Each detention order is reviewed at least once a year, ensuring that such procedures are never static. During detention, a board of inspection makes unannounced spot checks on detention centres. And finally, judicial review of detention cases ensures that the laws of Singapore are not abused. Hence, detention without trial protects the security of our nation. But let me move on to my second point, on the procedural demands of a trial. Now, the key procedural features of a trial are the compulsory presentation of evidence and the cross-examination of witnesses. Under the Criminal Procedure Code 2010, Section 283, the court is obligated to summon any person to testify if it thinks its evidence is essential to making a just decision. And Kadar versus the Public Prosecutor establishes that the prosecution is under duty 
to disclose any material which might be regarded as credible and relevant to the guilt or innocence of the accused to the defence before the trial. And what does this mean? When we review all our intelligence and evidence in the court of law, this compromises our ongoing efforts to prevent future attacks. In a trial, we would have to disclose who our undercover witnesses were and thus expose them to retaliation. Under cross-examination, we would have to review the extent of our surveillance, allowing suspects to change their meeting locations or communication channels. This information inevitably finds its way to those who threaten our society and destroys overnight the extent of our intelligence. By comparison, detention without trial is an expedient means of removing suspects from society, averting the immediate threat to life. In addition, witnesses, local and abroad, may not want to testify in court because they fear reprisals. While these witness accounts might be strong, reliable evidence, they are often presented anonymously and hence cannot be cross-examined. In these cases, detention without trial protects the identity of the witness while considering his testimony. For example, in September 2007, when members of a secret society attacked five people with parangs at Yunos Crescent, eyewitnesses to the incident were unwilling to testify in court. In that case, as in 366 others from 2004 to 2008, the Criminal Law Temporary Provisions Act was used to detain these criminals, keeping organised crime off our streets. Finally, foreign intelligence agencies provide tip-offs to Singaporean authorities on the basis that such information will not be reviewed in the courtroom. This information is often highly classified, with security implications for allies as well. If we blatantly review such information, our allies will simply stop sharing it with us. And this means that our security forces will be unable to act on certain life-saving information in the future. Hence, in all these ways, a trial compromises on our security. But moving on to my third and final point on how the, how the outcome of a trial does not ensure rehabilitation and justice. And here we need to consider two key groups in society. If I were a drug abuser in Team Opposition's world, what would happen to me? We impose very harsh penalties on drug users to deter consumption and trafficking. This suggests that one mistake I made in my life will forever hurt my reintegration into society. Under the Constitution, the public prosecutor can exercise discretion as to whether to charge an offender or let him off with a stern warning and probation. The latter option is often exercised with young, first-time offenders. However, this option is not available when the offender suffers from addiction. What then is a better alternative? A system where drug addicts can be cured of their addiction, realise their mistakes and re-enter society. And this is what Part 4 of the Misuse of Drugs Act does by allowing the state to detain a person who requires treatment or rehabilitation from drug addiction. Similarly, the Internal Security Act works to rehabilitate fundamental terrorists. And because justice is about striking a balance between society and the individual, detention without trial in Singapore is justified. The speaker spoke for 8 minutes and 23 seconds. We thank the speaker for her speech.